X23, temperature and heat. The elementary particles of thermal physics, thermal physics, are molecules or more elementary particles. Molecule, for example, H2O. What is this molecule? This is a water molecule. And a molecule is a composite particle. Composite, it is, it is composed of something else. For example, water molecule consists of two hydrogen atoms and one oxygen atom. And they are connected to construct a single molecule, right? So molecule consists of atoms. Molecule is a composite particle. However, as long as it does not break these bondages, for example, if it is uh, broken, it, it will be transformed into hydrogen and oxygen and we, we combine with uh, something else. However, as long as such kind of chemical process doesn't happen, then it is a tiny enough to allow a particle approximation. We don't have to worry about the structure of this single molecule, as long as this bondage does not break down, okay? Thermal physics works only if the number n of pa uh, participants is a very large. Thermal physics is valid for, for example, a mole. A mole is called a very large number. Its name is Avogadro's number, something like that. If it is, if you consider three molecules or two molecules or 10 molecules, it is a very difficult to find the uh, statistical nature of collective identical particles. So when we consider thermal physics, we consider a set of a very large number of identical particles that is called molecules, sometimes atoms. The theory of almost free many particles requires a statistical understanding. If you consider a few particles we can apply what we learned until now. However, if you have a lot of particles of order 10 to 23rd or higher, then you need to change your mind and approach to understand such kind of a very large number of particles is based on statistical mechanics that we learn from now on. Number two, any matter consists of atoms. Yes, in our nature, matter consists of atoms. A molecule contains a single atom or atoms. For example, this is a molecule and these are atoms, okay? Helium, this is a single molecule atom. H2, two molecule atom. O2, N2, two molecules. Three molecules. Uh, uh, two, two atom, two atom, two atom, two atom, three atom, a single molecule, 
properties, these are all single molecules. And this is single atom molecule. An atom of a single substance consists of nucleus and electrons. Here, atom, atom. This is a hydrogen atom. This atom has proton at the center and electron. They are connected with electromagnetism, that is electrostatic force binds together. So this one is called the nucleus and this is electron. Helium more complicated. Anyway, any any atom lithium, beryllium, and so on, any atom consists of nucleus and electrons, hydrogen or single electron. The other cases, many electrons. If an atom is neutral, electrically neutral, that number of protons inside the nucleus is the same as the number of electrons surrounding them. An element of a nucleus is called a nucleo. This is proton, but sometimes there are many protons and many neutrons inside a nucleus. Any element inside a nucleus is called nucleon. This is also nucleon. And nucleon is either, either proton or neutron. Nothing else in our nature. So atom, nucleus, electron. Nucleus consists of nucleons, and nucleons is either a single nucleon is either proton or neutron. Number three, a standard notation identifying an atom is of the form X. This symbol is something like H, H, E, L, I, B, E, C, O, N, something like that. This, this atomic symbol. Atomic symbol. There are two numbers, A and Z. A represents mass number. Z represents the atomic number. We know nucleon consists of protons and neutrons. This Z atomic number is number of protons. This A is the number of proton or neutrons. So A is sometimes A equals Z, but because of neutrons, A is typically 
greater than z. A can never, A can never be less than z. One mole, we just learned that very large number 6.022140767 times 10 to the 23rd. This is a very large number. What's for this very large number? Because any molecule is a very, very tiny. It is a very difficult to measure the mass of a single molecule. However, if you collect identical molecules with such kind of large number, then you can measure the mass of those molecules. And the number, Avogadro's number, represents the number to have one mole of the atoms, for example, atoms, for example, hydrogen atom, one mole of hydrogen atom, hydrogen is one once, something like that. Because hydrogen atom has just a single proton in the nucleus, and there is a no neutron in the nucleus. So atomic number is one, atomic number is one, and mass number is one. However, it is a very, very tiny one. It is very difficult to express the magnitude of the mass. Instead, if you collect very large number of hydrogen <coughs> atom, <coughs> this six point times 10 to the 23rd, then you will get one gram of hydrogen atoms. Okay, so this is the origin of a very large number called Avogadro's number. Okay. The atomic number is the number of protons in a single nucleus. I explained already. The mass number is the number of nucleus that is either proton or neutron. Electrically neutral atom carries the same number of electrons as protons. Yes. Proton carries the electric charge plus E, where E is the elementary charge. And electron carries the electric charge exactly the same amount, but the sign is opposite. So if the number of protons and number of electrons are the same, the sum gives a zero. So net charge becomes a zero. So that is called electrically neutral. So the number of neutron doesn't matter as far as the, uh, an atom is electrically neutral then the number of protons inside the nucleus is the same as the number of electrons trapped by the nucleus. Number four, nature is eventually made of quarks, leptons, and gauge bosons. Yes. We have nucleon. Nucleon is a proton, either proton or neutron. Actually, each proton and each neutron consists of quarks, UUD, and this is a UDD. This U is called up quark, 
the D is called the down quark. And up quark has electric charge two thirds of electric charge. D minus one third of electric charge. Two up quarks, two times two thirds minus single down quark produces plus one. Aha, so proton has a plus E charge, plus E neutron, single up quark, double down quark. Aha electrically neutral, the zero charge. So protons and neutrons are, consist of quarks. We know the electron, and the electron is a kind of lepton. So nature consists of quarks and lepton. In addition, the mediator that connects any charged particle, any massive particle, that is called the gauge boson. And gauge boson, for example, photon is the gauge boson for the electromagnetic interaction. So there are fundamental, absolutely fundamental particles, quarks, leptons, and gauge bosons. Hadrons are composite particles consisting of quarks. Yes. D is a proton and neutron. They are a kind of hadrons. There are a lot of kinds of hadrons in nature. Although what we know for lepton is only for the electron, and actually, there are two more generalized electrons, muon and tau. These two particles are much heavier than the electron. In addition, the antiparticle. Antiparticle carries opposite charge, but mass is the same. Antiparticle. So these are leptons. Sure, there are anti-quarks in nature. Anti-particle has opposite charge, but mass is as the same. Gauge bosons mediate fundamental interactions. Photon, its symbol is gamma, mediates the electromagnetic interaction Fundamental forces are electromagnetic force and the strong interaction. The strong interaction, they combine these protons and neutrons very strongly. For example, if you consider the electromagnetic interaction only, protons, neutrons, they are electrically neutral. Nobody knows how, how to bind these electrically neutral object inside a very, very tiny space in the nucleus. Nobody knows how to combine these two because the Coulomb interaction is a very strongly repulsive. How can I combine them into a, a very tiny region? Electromagnetic can never explain this kind of very basic nature. That is the strong interaction and weak interaction. That weak interaction also explains in combination of these two that is called the nuclear, nuclear force. Their mediator the mediator for the strong interaction is a gluon. So this is a, a kind of photon in strong interaction. 
a Z and W particles are all, they are all discovered by 1980s. Okay. A nucleon consists of three quarks. Yes, nucleons are in a tiny region. For example, this is a, named after fermi, femtometer, 10 to minus 15 meter. Can you imagine such kind of short distance? Nuclear force consisting of strong and weak interactions over that overwhelms the electromagnetism and the gravitational force as well in a tiny region. However, we do not consider such kind of interaction because at very low energy level, what we consider that we face in everyday life is these these interactions, these, these complicated interactions does not have to be considered when we consider uh, usual statistical mechanics. So even though there are substructures, still we can think a molecule is a stable particle and that is a, that uh, we we can ignore the structure of molecules. Another important thing to remember is that many particle system, we have center of mass, relative coordinate relative to the center of mass, and total mass of the system. We remember the total kinetic energy of n particle system can be expressed as a sum of these two components. This is the kinetic energy of a single particle in which all of the particles are concentrated at a single point. And this is the kinetic energy relative to the center of mass. If we choose the frame of reference as the center of mass, that we find this one disappears and we only have to consider this. When we consider thermal physics using statistical mechanics, we always ignore the motion of the center of mass and we concentrate on the relative motion with respect to the center of mass. So we, we always consider the system in the cent center of mass frame. And this internal kinetic energy is a very important one in statistical mechanics. This internal kinetic energy. Previously, when we studied the rigid body, this one was expressed as, as a something like that, one half I omega squared. Now, we, we will interpret this internal kinetic energy as a heat. Number seven, that uh, standard physical definition of temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of the elementary particles of thermal physics molecules. Yes, right. Especially in the CM frame. CM frame. Now, new concept appears. We learn the internal kinetic energy of n particle system. Now 
you'd like to interpret this internal kinetic energy, average value of the internal kinetic energy of elementary particles is to be interpreted as a temperature. That's quite important. Temperature is proportional to the internal kinetic energy. Internal kinetic energy. We will study it in detail in the future. The SI unit, the SI unit of temperature is Kelvin. There is a no degree Kelvin or Kelvin degree. There is a no such symbol, only K itself. And this Kelvin is of is all proportional is proportional to the energy that is what energy average kinetic energy of molecules temperature is not bounded above because has no upper limit yes right this temperature is proportional to this amount and this is a sum of positive numbers. At least it is all zero. So minimum value of this internal kinetic energy must be zero. So the temperature, minimum value of the temperature is a zero K where the internal kinetic energy is exactly zero. However, there is no upper limit of the internal kinetic energy. Therefore, there is no upper limit for the temperature. Now, now I say this temperature is called absolute, absolute temperature. Absolute temperature. Number eight. The average kinetic energy is the same for any part. Yes, if the number of molecules is very large, then inside a container, there are many, many molecules, but whatever part you take, the average is the same. This is true only if it is in thermal equilibrium. By definition, if a, a very large number of molecules are in thermal equilibrium, then any sample of molecules have the same average kinetic energy. Average kinetic energy of any part is independent of time. Thermal equilibrium states that there is, it is a steady state, so it is independent of time. A thermal equilibrium can be defined for n particle system where n is a very large. A thermal equilibrium cannot be defined for few particle system, sure. That's the reason why the statistical physics to describe a thermal physics is valid only if n is a very large and the system is in thermal equilibrium. Temperature, pressure, all kind of thing. These are all the same independently of time. Only if and is very large only if it is in thermal equilibrium at temperature T. A thermal equilibrium can be defined, okay. The state has the greatest probability in comparison with other states that are not in equilibrium. Thermal equilibrium has the largest probability. For example, container contains a very large number of molecules and you, you are 
sitting down on a chair. And this chamber is full of molecules. Statistically, it is possible to have all these molecules concentrated in the tiny region. And this is a vacuum. What happens if the remaining piece is, uh, is uh, in vacuum? You can never live. You cannot breathe. It is possible, but this uh, probability is uh, essentially zero. And the state with the thermal equilibrium is the state every part has the same pressure, same temperature, something like that. This equilibrium state has the most probable, most greatest probability. Nine, if bodies A and B are in each thermal equilibrium with a third body, there's a C, we have A and B, A and C are in thermal equilibrium at temperature T. C and B are in thermal equilibrium in temperature T. Then A and B has the same temperature. This is the zeroth law of thermodynamics. Mathematically trivial, however, physically, uh, it is a very distinguished one from the state that is not in equilibrium. A diathermal wall allows the heat transfer that is opposite to insulator. Thermal insulator does not allow the heat transfer, but diathermal wall allows the heat transfer. If two gases separated by a diathermal wall are in thermal equilibrium with, with each other, then they have common temperature. Thermal equilibrium assumes a definite temperature, common temperature. The minimum value of temperature is defined by zero Kelvin. Here, this temperature is absolute, absolute temperature. From today on, in the remainder of this semester, temperature means always as absolute temperature in units of Kelvin. For a long time, the triple point of water, for example, when I learned the absolute temperature reference was a triple point of water, but now we do not use as the reference. In a triple point, uh, triple point cell, solid ice, liquid water, and water vapor coexist. So this is the definition of the triple, triple point of water. In thermal equilibrium at only one set of values of pressure and temperature. Intuitively, it is a well-defined quantity, but as far as accuracy is concerned, uh, we do not have to introduce this kind of Practical, uh, practical approach of uh, define, defining the absolute temperature. Triple point of water is not an official reference anymore. Yes, right. In 2019, many units uh, were redefined. It accepts the absolute value governed by the relativity and many other fundamental uh, conservative quantities. So there are seven 
physical quantities that are exactly, exactly defined. One of them is a Boltzmann constant. The Boltzmann constant is the constant whose value is uh, exactly this, a very tiny number, but this one shows that if you multiply Kelvin both sides, so KBT, KBT has the dimension of a joule, then means this is energy. So KBT is the energy scale. This is a this uh, KBT is a unit of internal kinetic energy of molecules. So very, very important from today on. So KBT has exactly the same numerical value, except that this dimension is in joule. The unit is joule. So this is this is a wrong notation. Three hundred Kelvin, so just K. Okay. To express this, we can introduce SI prefix. The unit of a temperature difference is also K. There are practical conversion between Celsius and Fahrenheit. In Korea, we solely use the Celsius, but in US, they still use a Fahrenheit. There is a scaling factor, the delta T temperature difference has the ratio and there is a, a number 32. So that uh, the relation that connects the two temperature is exactly this. So when we substitute the zero degree of Celsius, that corresponds to 32 degrees in Fahrenheit. So 32 degrees in Fahrenheit is a zero degrees in Celsius. And that is 273.15 Kelvin. If you substitute 100 in here, you will get 212 degrees in Fahrenheit or 373.15 Kelvin. Usually of materials such as uh, matter change its volume due to the motion of uh, vibration of molecules. So we can define the coefficient of the coefficient of linear expansion alpha change ratio of a change in the length delta t if you change the temperature from t to t plus delta t the length l changes from l to l plus delta l then we can define the ratio as alpha. The unit of alpha is because the length of scale is canceled on only the temperature inverse. 
if you have the alpha, then what happens to the case of a plate? If you increase the temperature, then the plates will expand along this direction, x direction, and y direction too. So this is the change in area. So from LL to L plus delta L and L plus delta L. So original area was A that was L square. And if you increase the temperature by delta T, its side, both sides will expand from L to L plus delta L. If you expand this, you will get L square two times L delta L plus delta L square. Neglecting this high order piece, then you will find L square factored out plus two times delta L over L. So by definition, delta L over L is alpha delta T. So you will find A prime minus A equals over A equals E two times L over uh, delta L over L. And delta L over L is alpha delta T, so two times alpha delta T. Therefore, if the coefficient of linear expansion is alpha, the coefficient of uh, area expansion, beta, is approximately twice of the linear expansion. In a similar manner, we can consider the volume expansion. If the rate is the same for x, y, z axis, isotropic, then finally we get factor of three in the case of volume. Fourteen. Temperature is proportional to the average kinetic energy of molecules in a sample. Yes, until now, we learned that KBT is the scale of average kinetic energy, average value of this kinetic energy of many molecules in thermal equilibrium. When the temperature of a sample increases or decreases, the total kinetic energy of the system increases, decreases, because molecules are very large and they are in thermal equilibrium. The number of molecules is just proportional to this temperature. So total, total kinetic energy must be the average value of the kinetic kinetic energy multiplied by the number of molecules. Next, the thermal calorie is exactly this. This is a, a very important discovery that the heat is the same as energy. It took a very long time to notice that heat is identical to energy because of this, because of this understanding. Temperature is the average kinetic energy of molecules. So this is to be remembered. And in a certain society, they prefer this kind of value. But in, if you study physics, just use this conversion factor. One calorie is 
exactly defined, exactly defined by 4.184 Joule. An object accepts heat, now heat is energy, resulting in the temperature raise by delta T, the heat capacity, heat capacity. This is a definition of heat capacity, a very, very important. Energy accepted by this material or sample, you apply energy that is a delta Q into a system and it's better to write like that. You have temperature T and supply heat, then you have T plus delta T, then amount of energy, heat energy, divided by the temperature change is the heat capacity. It is trivial to find that delta Q is the heat capacity multiplied by the temperature change. We will frequently make use of this identity. The unit of heat capacity is energy is either in calorie or joule divided by, divided by absolute temperature. The heat capacity is proportional to the mass for a uniform material. Yes, because they are, they are linearly dependent on the total mass. If you know the heat capacity of one gram, the heat capacity of two grams, it will be 2C, something like that. The specific heat of an object with the heat capacity C and mass M is not a speed of light, but specific heat, specific heat that is independent of mass. So scaled by mass. So heat capacity is a proportional to mass. So we divide this heat capacity by the mass. This is the specific heat. So this is the heat capacity unit divided by mass. This is the unit for specific heat. One mole is, yes, we know very well, the molar specific heat of a material Molar specific heat, haha. -ha. Molar specific heat. When we divide this uh, heat capacity with mass, we do not divide by the whole mass. Instead, one mole of mass. So then you will find the heat specific heat for one mole. That is called the molar specific heat the specific heat of one mole. The unit of the molar specific heat, now it is just number of particles, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. Find the false statement regarding the phase of matter. Three phases of matter, a solid, liquid, gas you know very well when a material is in a, in a single uh, in a phase of transition phase transition is solid to liquid liquid to gas sometimes a solid to gas directly and both direction we call this a phase of transition when a material is in a phase transition the temperature is the same. However, it either accepts or produces heat. 
So we, we require a certain amount of energy to break down the bondage of molecules, very strong, intermediate, and very weak. So to break the bondage of solid, we need some energy to let the molecules move rather freely in comparison with solid. It results in liquid, and then you add more energy to the liquid, the molecules in liquid phase, then you can obtain gas, something like that. That is, that I call the heat of transformation that is required for the phase transition. This heat of transformation, L, is the ratio of the heat relative to the mass, delta M. Always when we calculate the heat, then the, by amount of mass, then you will find a constant value that is called the heat of transformation. Heat of transformation can be distinguished for the vaporization of the amount of energy for liquid and gas, vaporization. Liquid to gas, vaporize, backward is called the condensate. The heat of vaporization of water is this. Heat of fusion, amount of energy per unit mass must be added to melt the solid. Solid liquid, fusion. Okay, 17. Object A with heat capacity Ca initially at temperature Ta is placed in a thermal contact with object B with heat capacity Cb and initially at temperature Tb. The combination is thermally isolated, hence the sum of the energies of the two parts is invariant. Okay. It is a closed system. We assume that the heat capacities are independent of the temperature and no phase changes occur. Find the false statement. Ta and Tb. Ta is a hot and Tb is a cold. So you mixed up, for example, mixed up hot TA, hot water, TB, cold water, mix them up in a container that is thermally insulated. So what is the temperature T? Final state temperature after thermal equilibrium. Okay, this one has CA, what is a CA? Heat capacity. CB is heat capacity. You know TA, TA is a hot TB, and everybody knows that this temperature is in between because of your experience. The A loses energy. This is hot. And this is cold, so hot, final, final, cold. So this is positive, this is positive. So we have the energy conservation, the energy lost by hot water, energy accepted by the cold water because this system is thermally 
insulated. So they give and take the same amount of heat. This identity gives your answer for the final temperature of the two mixed water. And the answer is this. <laughs>